Hello again. In today's video, I am going to talk about some of the positive effects of stress and what you can do to maximize that effect. Now, we already have discussed quite a bit about the negative impact of stress. In fact, one of the definitions of stress, uh, as defined by Hans Selye, the father of stress research, was that Stress is essentially the wear and tear of the body. And the wear and tear happens because of our body responding to those threats in the environment. So if that's the case, how can stress be good for us? Because with that wear and tear, we ultimately get diseased and we die. I have in fact shared with you research about how about 80% of the physician visits are related to stress and about 50% of the deaths happening in America is related to again stress. So then how can stress be good for us when it has such a negative impact on our health? That's what we will try to answer in this discussion. So to understand this we need to go back to our discussion that we had had about the fight or flight response. I hope you remember this from my last lecture. Walter Cannon was the person who came up with this phrase of fight or flight response. So anytime there is a threat in the environment, our sympathetic nervous system gets into uh, Our sympathetic nervous system gets into the active mode. So our pupils start dilating, our heartbeat starts increasing, our um, we start getting a parched mouth. Our uh, digestion is inhibited at that point of time because again, you know, the more important thing is to save ourselves from the imminent threat. Digestion can be taken care of later, right? So our blood gets pumped into our muscles so that we are ready to fight or, or run away, right? So that's what happens when our uh, sympathetic nervous system gets into the active mode. When we are relaxed, when we don't have a threat, or in case of animals, you know, we have discussed this before, um, after the threat is gone, they get into, get back into the rest and digest mode. They are not feeling threatened anymore, right? So that's when the parasympathetic nervous system is active. So at that point of time, you are having your normal digestion, you are having your normal salivation, uh, everything, so, you know, your body is um, having the slow, uh, deeper breath and you know, your heartbeat is uh, slower. So all those things are happening when you are resting, when your body is not feeling threatened. Now, so this is of course important. This fight or flight is important for your survival. So because with your body getting aroused, it is now getting ready to fight with the, with the physical threat that is there to your life. And of course, when you don't have that threat, again, the parasympathetic nervous system is important because um, we need to have proper digestion, we need our entire body to function normally in order to live long, healthy lives. So, of course, one way to think about uh, this is that if if we are always in the rest and digest mode, then probably we will live uh, long, happy, you know, lives will not be stressed. But that's not entirely true. Why? Because well, you cannot avoid. Uh, threats in your life. There will always be threats in your life. May not necessarily be in form of the kind of uh, life threats that happened uh, when we uh, lived uh, during the hunter-gatherer society. Uh, right now, there is much less of a risk to our lives. But still, there are threats of we losing job, we losing a life partner and all kinds of stuff that. So it is practically not possible that we, we will live a life where we are not at all getting threatened, right? So the sympathetic nervous system 
of course helps in our survival and it helps in our survival by arousing us by by getting us aroused to fight with the threat or fleeing away from it now that arousal component is really important to understand so way back in 1908 there were these two psychologists robert yerkes and john dodson who conducted an experiment that provided some real cool insights about how stress can actually be good for us but only when it is experienced at a moderate level so this is what they were doing they were behaviorists um, and if you know behaviorists initially they did a lot of their experiments on animals bf skinner was uh, the pioneer there uh, but in any case uh, without digressing so these psychologists they were trying to train the guinea pigs to navigate a complex maze to to ultimately reach the other end and and get food as the reward okay so they were checking the effect of reward on how quickly they learned to navigate the maze they then later on decided that hey we should also check whether punishments um, helps them learn to navigate the maze quickly and yes it turned out uh, that when these guinea pigs were given mild shocks okay so they had those electrodes attached uh, and when they were given mild shocks they actually learned faster they could navigate the maze faster and reach the other end of um, they could escape the maze faster so with that logic if we increase the level of shock the these mice or these guinea pigs should learn even faster right it turned out to be no when these guinea pigs were given a bigger shock they actually stopped learning they started just you know wandering around uh, the maze without without learning how to navigate it properly so they got actually too stressed so this is what led yerkes and dodson to propose what is called as the yerkes dodson law so when you have little bit of stress which is what happened here little bit of shock in your life that is good that will actually enhance your learning that will actually enhance your performance but if you have too much of stress that's when you have the negative effects on you so this is something that even actually hansley talked about he actually coined the term u stress u stress is the good stress and distress is the bad stress so if we uh, talk about uh, use stress and distress taking into account yerkes dodson law what we see is that if there is too much of stress then you experience distress that's when your performance starts declining you don't perform as well anymore if you are not at all stressed you know you are probably calm or you know maybe you may be in feel, feeling bored but you need some amount of stress some moderate amount of stress to perform well to to learn things well and if you would relate this with some of the experiences that you may have had in your lives i think you should be able to relate to this when you have an exam coming up soon you know the same paper same books that you were studying before um you can study it much more efficiently because you are much more aroused here so the, the level of arousal is higher because of the imminent uh, threat of the exam now if the exam is just tomorrow morning and you are not prepared then uh, you will not be experiencing you stress you probably will be experiencing distress and you won't be even be able to study uh, what you would have been able to study um, had the exam was a year <laughs> in in uh, a year away from you
right? But if, if the exam is just a week or two away from you, uh, you probably will not be as stressed like you know experiencing distress. Instead, you will be stressed enough to increase your alertness, to, uh, to increase your motivation to work hard to perform well on the stress uh, on the tests so that's what is the yerkes Stotson law so in here we do realize that all stress is not bad and this is something that i have been emphasizing as well of course in form of a different diagram so it's not that all demands all problems are bad that's what i have been emphasizing rather uh, when demands exceed your capacity that's when you experience stress that's what i have told you but the same diagram that i had before i can actually actually let me clear this um, oh, eraser let's clear this come on Okay, so imagine this is the x-axis and uh, well, this is exactly what is happening. So in here, you are not stressed. This is where you want to be because this is the region where you are optimally stressed and you don't want to be there in this region because you are overly stressed okay so uh, because of the x-axis and y-axis being different here we see that same information being presented differently so here we have demands or problems on the x-axis and capacity on the y-axis so that's the reason we had a different uh, form of uh, graph in here it is the level of stress and performance on the y-axis so that's the reason we uh, see different forms of uh, different forms of graph. But in, in some ways, we are still talking about the same things. So too much of stress, bad. Moderate amount of stress is good. Too little stress um, will keep you maybe calm and maybe potentially bored. Uh, and that is exactly what I had talked about here. So now, if there is too much of problems in your life compared to your capacity, you will be highly stressed. So too much of stress will be bad for you. If your capacity is higher than the problems that you have, you will be in the calm, composed position. Potentially, if, you, if you're, that's what you're doing for long periods of time, you may actually feel unchallenged, bored. But when there is a match, approximate match it doesn't exactly have to be a perfect match but approximate match between the difficulty level of the problem that you're dealing with and your capacity you are stressed to the optimum level and that's what we can say is you stress okay so what i had previously called was the flow state can in fact be restated as you stress use stress here okay so so first thing we need to understand is that all stress is not bad stress can actually be good for you and this is really important it is extremely important in fact which you will realize when i share um, some of the most recent studies that have been done on this particular topic so what you believe about stress will have some important effect on how your body reacts to stress okay so before we go into the newer studies uh, there are some practical implications that uh, we need to also understand from yerkes dodson law which is typically represented in this uh, graph okay uh, the more too much of stress leads to problem distress moderate amount of stress is good which is higher performance, too little stress, again, your performance will be low because you will not be motivated. Uh, you will not be aroused enough to perform well. Similar to the example of your exam being six months or eight months away, you will not be as uh, alert to uh, perform well, to, to study well, okay? 
Now, uh, what I wanted to point out here is that it is, it's not as clean a graph always. The depending on your personality, different, depending on the nature of task that you're working, we may see uh, the, the graph having different kind of shapes. So it is not always going to be a normal distribution, a clean bell-shaped curve. That's essentially what I'm trying to emphasize here. So, uh, so imagine you are working on a easy task, okay? Task that is very easy. So on the x-axis, we still have the arousal. Too much of arousal is distress. Too little arousal is you calm and moderate level arousal is um, what so this would be what we had seen the middle uh, portion is what we had seen before okay but if the task is too easy for you okay then even when the uh, let me uh, go back to my pen option okay so when the task is too easy for for you you can perform at even if you are too aroused you can still perform well perform at a high level right but if the task is too difficult for you then you will not be able to perform at high level of arousal okay your your performance will start taking a dip even with moderate levels of arousal if the task is too difficult Okay, uh, similar kind of pattern could be, you know, talked about in form of your skill level. So if you are highly skilled, if you are highly skilled, so that will be the green line that we see here. So if you are highly skilled, let's say mm, you, you are a highly skilled basketball player. Okay, uh, you can perform well, really well even even at high levels of what we call stress which would have typically gone into distress level so your performance will start dipping only when it goes really high otherwise even at high levels of arousal your performance is going to be good but if you are if you if you're not very skilled and you're performing on an important match then you will be in the blue line so you will not be able to perform well. You, you will get into the distress zone much sooner. You will get into the distress zone much sooner than somebody who is highly skilled. So this then gives us some great ideas about uh, where pointer options. So this gives us some great ideas about then how we can make stress work for us. Again, similar to what I have been emphasizing, you increase your capacity, you increase your skill level. So hopefully you are seeing what I have been mentioning before and relating it with, um, with Yerkes Dodson law. So one way to make stress work for you in terms of helping you perform better is to enhance your skill level or oh, another way is of course to work on easy task <laughs> uh, but then after a point of time you will get bored you know if uh, but the if you are getting more skilled then you you will start getting the benefits that come from um, from high skill in terms of high pay so you will start getting the benefits Plus, at the same time, you will also not be getting highly stressed. Hope you get this idea. A similar kind of arguments could be made with respect to task familiarity, which is nothing but, you know, if the task is too familiar to you, it will be an easy task. If it's uh, too difficult for you, then it's going to be uh, too, if unfamiliar with it, then it's difficult task. So similar to the easy, difficult task. But uh, same with respect to task complexity. But I wanted to quickly also touch upon um, your personality traits, certain personality traits, and I will discuss the effect of personality traits on stress in much greater detail in uh, some other videos. But there are certain personality traits, like neuroticism, for instance. 
Neuroticism, in fact, is defined as people's tendency to experience stress. That's one of the ways that neuroticism is defined. So some people tend to be higher on this neuroticism dimension. That's what their personality trait is. So those people will follow closer to this blue line. Okay. They, those people will follow closer to the blue line. So their optimum performance will be there only at relatively lower levels of arousal. They can't, th their performance is going to take a huge dip even at the relatively moderate levels of arousal. Whereas, whereas somebody who is low on neuroticism, some, somebody who is emotionally stable, that's with, with that kind of personality trait, that person will have a, the, the graph of that person will be closer to the green line that we see here. That person can take a lot of you know stress, arousal and, and still not be feeling distressed. So hope you are getting what I am trying to explain here. So stress can have a positive impact on your performance. And you know, we all want to perform better. We all want to be successful in our lives. Because when we perform better, we start then getting a lot of rewards, a lot of benefits. So how can then we make stress work for us? By getting more skilled. Maybe by learning certain techniques where we are then not easily distressed, you know, where we can minimize probably the impact of neuroticism, things like that. You know, how to do all those things, I will discuss in later videos. But one thing that we need to understand for, uh, with, with complete clarity, which, which we need to internalize is stress is not completely bad, at least based on Yerkes Dodson's model. In fact, it is great for performance. Now the question is, okay, we understand stress is not all bad. In fact, stress can be great, uh, which is what is called eustress, but that is only in the short term. In the long term, when stress poses, we get sick, right? That's in fact what Hansley talked about in the general adaptation syndrome, which uh, I shared with you in my last lecture. So the alarm stays was equivalent to the fight or flight response. But when that threat poses, poses either because you know you cannot divorce your um, uh, abusive spouse or you cannot get rid of your boss, abusive boss, you know, then of course the, the threat persists, right? So you then continue to stray, uh, stay stressed and which then ultimately leads to the exhaustion stage where we see disease and you know death all those kinds of difficulties so uh, so from yerkes dodson's perspective moderate level of stress is good but moderate also in the short term right but if we are having long term stress how can it be good for us it turns out it can still be good for us if we manage our thoughts. So that's uh, what I'm going to discuss next. And I will reference a study from 2012, which will explain this better. Okay. So uh, actually, before I go there, uh, one thing that we need to realize is this, it, we go into the resistance stage, not only because of the presence of the uh, threat, the continuation of the pre uh, presence of the threat. That is sometimes the case, like, you know, you can't get rid of your boss or uh, abusive boss or whatever, right? Uh, but many a times we go into the resistance stage because we, we believe, we have these thoughts about, we, we, we can't get rid of those negative thoughts, right? Remember, uh, threats can be imagined. That's something that we have discussed too. So if you can't get rid of those imagined dangers, then uh, you will be in perpetual resistance stage, which will ultimately lead you to get exhausted, get diseased, uh, right? So, uh, 
So then how do we manage that? So what I'm saying is that, it, and this is this part is from your textbook, you manage them by having the correct belief system about, about stress. So um, there are many ways that we manage stress. You know, one is by tackling our beliefs and thoughts, another way is by uh, tackling our behavior, then at a spiritual level. So these are things that you know have been briefly touched in your textbook. Um, but right now I'm focusing more on the beliefs and thoughts part, okay, which will also have impact on the behavior. But so here's a study that was published in 2012, and it is one of the um, highly cited research papers. Now the table that you see here may seem a little uh, overwhelming because a lot of statistics here but I will explain things so uh, that should make it intelligible so what these researchers did was that they surveyed um, close to 30,000 uh, adults in America okay 28,700 know, odd participants close to you know uh, 29,000 30,000 participants there and they asked them those similar kind of questions that I had shared with you in my first lecture how much of stress did you experience in the last one year okay some responded almost none some responded little some ex expressed moderate level of stress some expressed a lot of stress okay now the dependent variable is their health status so what was so or refers to odds ratio so what were the odds in comparison to those people who had experienced no stress in comparison to this group what was the likelihood that the people who had a lot of stress let me for simplicity uh, just compare these two groups people with lot of stress with people who had no stress yes people who had a lot of stress they had 75% more probability of having poor health. That's what this 1.75 odds ratio means. People with a moderate level of stress had 36% chances of having poor health and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is their actual physical health. And people who had a lot of stress they were you know really distressed so 735 percent or in other words 7 point, 7 7.3 times more psychological distress that's how psychologically distressed they were than those who had no stress and this is understandable right you know if you have a lot of stress in your life you predictably will be you know highly distressed you will be unhappy you will be so that's what we are seeing so this is not very surprising but you know this part may be a little bit interesting for you it is if you have a lot of stress in your life um, it does impact your health in a negative way and that's what we are seeing here but uh, wasn't i talking about the positive effects of stress here well hold on we will come there too so they also asked these participants what they believed about stress. Did they believe that stress had a negative effect on health or did they believe that stress did not impact their health? There were a lot of people who believed that stress did not have any effect on their health. But there were also lot of people who believed that stress did impact their health in a negative way in a huge way a lot so it impacted their health a lot now those who believed that stress impacts health negatively they had 4.2 times 4.26 times or 426 percent higher probability of having poor health okay they were of course more distressed as well five five times more distressed as well compared to those who believed that 
um, it does not impact their health now is this just staying in a make believe world even though research shows that stress impacts health is it like you know just making oneself believe that you no know, stress doesn't impact health so i think then i will be fine not exactly even though that's what it may seem here uh, let me discuss this further here with uh, the next uh, table from this same study because uh, in this study uh, in this table uh, these are separate questions right you know how much of uh, stress you experienced in the last uh, one year and do you believe that stress impacts your health these are two independent questions now uh, we don't know how these two questions or how people responded to these two questions combined in other words um, <clears throat> what about those people who believed that stress has a huge negative impact on health and they also experienced a lot of stress come if we compare that group with this group those who believe that stress does not impact health even if they had a lot of stress in their life so if we compare such groups we will find much more interesting results so that's what we will see here in this table so hr here does not mean human resources it means a, uh, a statistical term called hazard ratio okay so uh, the it's the probability of in this case mortality in probability of you dying so what is the probability that you will die uh, based on those questions that were asked so of course if you had absolutely no stress if you had absolutely no stress in the last 12 months and you also believed that stress did not impact your health in negative way that is the reference group okay so we are comparing people who had absolutely no stress and they also believe that stress does not impact their health in negative way we are comparing that group with all the other possible combinations <clears throat> so uh, again uh, so we have those who experience little stress and we have the different combinations of whether they believe stress was bad for them or little bad for them or not at all bad similarly people experiencing moderate stress and all those combinations for simplicity sake again let me compare the this group with those who experienced a lot of stress in the previous one year now in there we have those who believed that stress impacts health a lot okay now what do we see here we see they had 45% 43% chances of dying that mortality rate hazard ratio is 1.43 so 43% higher probability that they are going to die soon so uh compared to the group that did not have any stress and believed that stress did not impact their health interestingly so by the way any time the ratio is lower than 1 it means that the probability is less less than the comparison group that you are going to die okay so <laughs> so let's take a look at the probabilities here 0.96 slightly lower probability than 1 uh, the least probability we have is actually 0.83 this is super interesting isn't it so the lowest probability that we have is 0.83 so this is the group of people who experienced a lot of stress in the past one year but they believed that stress is not bad for them and that belief actually protected them because they had what 17% lower probability than the reference group of dying soon you get the idea here so your belief matters 
your belief matters in a significant way if you believe that stress is bad for you it is going to aggravate the negative impact that stress has on your life if you believe that stress is uh, no big deal it's just another stress i will <laughs> I, i can deal with it then it actually minimizes the negative impact that stress has on your health and in this case in in this table they are actually talking about the probability of you dying because you know when they are doing the study over a period of time some people die so based on how they are responded when they had initially taken the survey and when they are analyzing the data how many what percentage of people have died by then based on that they are calculating this mortality uh, hazard uh, ratios and it turns out that you know if you believe that stress is bad for you uh, and yeah, you had a lot of stress in the last one year the probability of you dying goes up by 43% compared to those who didn't have stress and believe that stress is not bad for them but if you even if you have had a lot of stress if you believe that stress does not impact your health in negative way uh, you are actually the safest you know you, you have the least probability of dying 17% lower than those who had no stress and i believe that uh, stress is not bad for them so again does this mean that we just have to believe <laughs> it's all about make believe then not exactly you know so it's it's i'm not trying to tell you that ignore scientific evidence uh, let me explain here how things happen our thoughts do have impact on our body and this is something that i'm going to explain in greater detail when we go to the biology of stress which is going to become much more complex so if you find this complex <laughs> this is probably going to be the easier part of the lecture so far you know once i start go uh, going deeper into the biology of stress it's going to be a little bit more complex but anyway no don't worry too much so in any case so this is the model that i have to explain how things work here so there are environmental demands stressors money problem spouse problem health problem in family this that economy problem bad boss and all that stuff the initial belief was that more problems more stress now we have refuted that we refuted that based on the idea that well problems will cause stress if we only have problems will cause stress if we do not have the capacity to deal with it right that's that's one thing that i talked about so if we have lower capacity then we will we will be stressed but if we have high capacity we will not be stressed right that's we will not be stressed we will actually flourish we will we will do really well we will you know, fly okay so that was one thing that i have already shared with you now here i'm talking about something else i'm saying that again those environmental stresses will automatically not lead to poor health and death it depends on what you believe do you believe that stress is bad for you do you believe that you know stress is something that is too no no that that that, that has bad impact on now if you do then we will have the negative impact if you if you believe that it does not have a negative impact then you will actually not experience those negative emotions that are experienced when you believe it is bad for you now you know it you believe it is bad for you so you feel even more distressed right <laughs> no. but you know it's if it is not if you believe that it is not bad for you then you won't get emotionally distressed you you actually will stay calm right and in other words you will stay happy and healthy even if you know there is problems in your life because you believe that it is not going to impact you in a negative way now if you believe that it is bad for you you will of course get more emotionally distressed now what happens when people are more emotionally distressed we have greater secretion of those stress hormones and it is you know that those are complex mechanisms which i'm going to discuss in uh, in my next lecture 
so that will be greater secretion of the stress hormones you will you will stay in that fight or flight mode for a longer period of time you will go into that resistance you will stay in that resistance phase of what hanseli had described in the general adaptation syndrome for a much longer period of time which will ultimately lead you to get diseased and die sooner and not just that there is another mechanism too if you are emotionally distressed you are much more likely to make even worse health decisions what happens when if you are unhappy you feel um, you feel like you know munching on some chips or you know um, opening the fridge and eating some junk food uh, we we tend to make poorer decisions when we are emotionally low right uh, we may drink alcohol so we we and and you know we may start smoking so we there's a greater likelihood of we making even worse health decisions engaging in poor health behaviors which will then of course uh, lead to uh, we getting diseased and we dying sooner so this is the mechanism through which how stressors ultimately impact us in a negative way but it is not automatic you have control you have control in terms of what you believe if you believe that it is not very bad for you you can not automatically go into this this negative spiral you can actually stay in the positive loop and continue to stay healthy so that's what i'm saying okay so uh, this is again based on research studies that i'm uh, not just the uh, things that i make up in my uh, head so uh, hopefully this uh, this diagram that i shared with you uh, provides some greater clarity about then how you can make stress work for you first of all don't worry too much about stress we get even more stressed by worrying about stress okay so that's the key thing to remember here of course you know you do always work on enhancing your capacity so uh, it, try to see the positive aspects of stress stress enhances our performance that's a great positive even if we are having stress in our life that's all right it it's not too bad for us because in fact this is what i would like to say why stress is not so how can you uh, just make up your mind that stress is uh, stress is oh, let's see stress is not bad for you how can you just make up your mind when you know of so many studies that stress is actually impacting your health in a negative way so this is how you make up your mind okay so we you get stressed when you know there are more demands more problems right how do you get how how do you enhance your capacity one way to enhance your capacity is to progressively deal with bigger demands bigger problems which is of course going to make you stressed but that's how you enhance your capacity right in other words if i want to become a faster runner or if i want to run longer distances than what i can right now i have to progressively um challenge myself in other words i have to progressively make things even more difficult for myself so these demands and problems i'm actually making it even more difficult i'm making i'm i'm deliberately choosing to be more stressed and through that process i actually progressively then over a period of time i enhance my capacity to long fast to to run faster and to run for longer distances okay that's the example that i'm giving with respect to running but it applies to everything one way that you enhance your capacity is through progressively challenging yourself more and more and more so that's one reason that you have now about how stress is not bad for you because stress is actually helping enhance your capacity so you should feel good about stress in your life once you feel good you will stay happy healthy 
So don't stress about your stress in life because that's going to worsen things further. Okay. So with that, I will uh, end my presentation here. Thank you.